this this message tonight it's it's interesting what the how and how the lord put this thing together and we'll see we'll see it how how it unpacks as we work through it um you know over the last um well i guess over the last year i've really tried to you know really really press into my quiet time um through my journaling through uh, reading of the word and of course we study uh, we study on um you know for putting passages or for putting sermons together we do a, a lot of studying for putting sermons together too but i've kind of tried to make it a conscious effort this year to to um read continually through the bible um you know cover to cover so to speak and not just not reading it cover to cover but reading it um you know i'm i'm in four different books a day um, a couple Old Testament books, a couple New Testament books, and and I've got a reading plan that kind of helps me, you know, where I'll read the New Testament twice, and Psalms, and I think the Old Testament once, I think is what it is. And it's interesting, you know, because it reminds you, you know, you know the stories, but if you haven't been there in a in a while, you kind of forget them sometimes, and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that, and and then you know, kind of, and it's interesting, um, you know, the. the in our, our 21st century church, um, a lot of times um, we don't spend too much time in the, in, the, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is rich with, with teaching. It's rich with uh, God's principles. It's rich with the understanding that um, it's always been through faith. God has always, uh, um, we, humanity has always been reconciled to God through faith. And, and in that faith, trust and obedience. And so um, I was reading through scripture and, and I, I got to second or excuse me, first chronicles, and we're gonna we're gonna start there tonight in First Chronicles, but before we get to First Chronicles chapter 10, um, when you're when you're doing what I'm, what I was saying, of reading through the scriptures. I want to encourage you to use one of those yearly Bible programs and stuff like that because um, you don't spend, you know, it's not like reading the whole Levit the whole book of Leviticus at one sitting. It's not, you know, because there's some dry stuff there, you know. So you can get you can get a, a chapter of First Chronicles. You know, there's a, a First Chronicles, a lot of names, a lot of stuff like that, and and you get through it. Right, and there's some information there, but you're not camped out there for a long period of time where you can get off and do another book on on the day on the, on the sitting, so to speak. And, and um, it's interesting. Uh, I'm gonna go. F I want to go to the end of this passage of scripture, Brandon, in in First Chronicles, because this is where it hit me, and then we'll back up and we'll go to verse one and and reread it. But this is in 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 first in verse thirteen, uh, and before I I. Let's just go for it, and then we'll figure it out later. So in verse 13, it says, So Saul died for a breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the commandment of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord, and therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David. The son of Jesse. And so as I was contemplating that verse, this phrase, breach of faith, just began to resonate with me. And so I do what most preachers do when they have this. They start looking up in their Bible, little Bible programs of, of you know, how many phrases there are, breach of faith in Scripture or broken faith and stuff like that. And then we go to the Greek and we do all that good stuff to see if there's any meat there. And 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 I did all that, and I was like, man, there's something here. There's something here. And so I'm hoping to unpack the something here tonight, right? But, but what we have to understand is that um, we have to understand the blessing that Saul had on his life. And so what I want to do is I want to back up. I want to go to First Chronicles uh, chapter 10. I want to pick it up in verse 1 to get the context of what this passage of scripture that was so kind of profound, so hitting in my life, 
Trenton to see what was going on in, in this in this spot. And so since now the Philistines, and I listen, I'm just going to confess to you right now, there's a couple of these names. Uh, I'm phonetic, phonetically challenged. I have a real hard hard time. So, um, you know, I'm going to do my best, but my best might, 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 might not be your goodness. So now the Philistines fought against the Israel, Israel, and the man of Israel fled before the Philistines and fled slain on the mountain of Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan, Abimenad, and this other fellow's name, the son of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and an archer found him, and he was wounded by an archer. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it. Least these uncircumcised come and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died. And thus Saul died, he and his three sons, and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to the strip, uh, strip the slain, to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. Gil and they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head to the temple of Dagog. But when the all the Jebus, Jebus I have a hard time here, friends, heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose, arose and took away his body, the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jebesh. They buried their their bones under the oak at Jebba and, fa and fasted seven days. This is the end. This is the kind of the obituary for Saul. This is the end of Saul's life. When we look at Saul's life, he was the first king of Israel. You remember way back when, when Israel cried out for a king like other nations, because they were ruled by judges, basically ruled by um, the judges of, that the Lord appointed, they wanted a king. And God set them soul. Back in 1 Samuel chapter, um, chapter 9, in verse 1, it says, and I'm just wanting to give you some background because Saul had very much the same anointing on his life as we have on our lives. There was a man, there was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, son of Zaor, son of Bekorath, son of Ephiah, a Benjamite a man of wealth, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And so Saul, there's a couple things we should know about him just by the scripture here. Number one is he came from a wealthy family. He wasn't hurting, so to speak. Supposedly, according to Scripture, he was the most handsomest man in all of Israel. And, by the sounds of it, he was the tallest man of all of Israel. At least, tradition would have it at least another head taller than the tallest man of Israel. And so, he had some things going for him, didn't he? He had, some, he had some things going for him, and the Lord, you know, the Lord chose him. 
Look, at you know, here's the thing, is that the people wanted a king. And so God gave them what they wanted. It's interesting, and I, I don't know who said this. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm sure a number of people have said it before. But just as the people of Israel, so the people of America, they get exactly what they want. <clears throat> if you don't like your leaders and you don't like how they're, they're behaving, guess what? They're a direct representation of us. Guess what? Saul was a direct representation of the people of Israel. And as his life lived out, we'll see that more. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, 1 Samuel chapter 10 in verse 6, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon, upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. Now, these, now when these signs meet you, this is uh, Samuel talking over, over uh, Saul, prophesying over him, meet you, do what, the, what your hands find to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me in Gilgad, and behold, I am count, coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. And so Samuel speaks over this anointing over, over um, Saul. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he, in verse 6, turns him into what? A new man. He turns Saul into a man, similar to how we are turned into a new, new man, new woman at salvation. Then God gave him a new heart. A heart, uh, I'm assuming a heart of flesh. But here's the interesting thing, is that when Samuel said to all the people, in, in uh, skipping on down to 24, verse 24, when Samuel said to all the people, do you see him who the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the, the rights and the duty and duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home in Gil Gilbath. And with him went men of valor, whose hearts God had touched. And so we look at this passage of Scripture, and we find out that God had chosen, specifically chosen, Saul for this kingship. There was none like Saul in all the people of all the land. And that God gave him favor among the people. These valiant men come and basically swore to Saul to follow him and to protect him. Saul takes, you know, here's the thing is that eventually Saul gets to the point where he begins to take matters into, into his own hand. You see, God had anointed him to lead the people of Israel. If you remember, Saul, um, Samuel was the one that had anointed him king over Israel. He had anointed him to do the job. The great thing about God is that he doesn't necessarily call the equipped. He equips the called. And a lot of times we see this throughout Scripture. In this particular time, Saul takes, you know, Saul takes matters into his own hands. You remember the prophecy that, that uh, Samuel just prophesied over Saul that he was to wait seven days before he went into battle. That he was going to come and give sacrifices uh, before they went into battle. So in 1 Samuel 13, picking it up in verse 8, it says, He waited seven days, he being Saul, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgad. Gil Gilgad. And the people were scattered from him. And so Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he had finished during the offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to, to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? 
And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Mishmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gil. Gil and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. And so I forced myself. I love that. I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command, command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall con not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. You see, in um, he just couldn't wait on the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, I did a sermon, sermon on the timing of the Lord. The his timing is perfect. Saul just couldn't wait. He couldn't wait for Samuel to show up. You know, here's the thing is that we have to really begin to trust the Lord. We say we have faith, but we breach faith all the time. We say we have faith, like I trust the Lord. Jesus is my Savior, right? He's the Lord of my life. But man, when people start leaving you, when people go on, man, you're some kind of crazy folk right there. What do we do? We start making our own way. We start making our own decisions. We start making our own plans. And they're going against the very will of God for our lives. And we don't even do it. We don't even know it. We don't even realize it. But we've just breached faith. As I was kind of praying and contemplating this, this deal of, breaching faith, I was, you know, tempted to, I started, um, you know, search the internet for, for breaching and, and uh, well, I got this pretty cool picture. I don't know if Pastor Lee's got it for me or not, but it's a picture of a breached wall in combat, right? And I, I think about this wall of faith that each one of us have been given. Each one of us have been given a measure of faith. It's a wall that's surrounding us, right? But soon as we breach faith with uh, what happens in this in this picture, it's our guys going into an enemy territory. But in our lives, when we breach faith, it's the enemy coming in. It, we are basically allowing him in. Every time we breach faith with the, with the Lord, we're giving an opportunity for the enemy to step into our lives. Does he come in every time? Is there a little devil waiting for for you when the the second you breach faith to jump in that hole? No. No, it's not. But here's the thing. We give opportunity. But see, here's a, there's, a, there's a small hole here, but then all of a sudden you breach faith again and the hole gets bigger. You breach faith again and the hole gets bigger. Next thing you know, the stinking wall's down. And then what do you got, folks? Then you go and take it a next step further because here's the thing. Instead of seeking the Lord, you do what Saul does. And maybe you didn't go here, but we may as well have. Look at it in verse, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 7 and 17. I, did, I Just because there, I have so much scripture here, and I know it's, I'm, I'm going to take too much time. But look at it in verse 7. It says, And then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium. Really? I mean, seriously. This guy has just been anointed by God. God has prophesied it over him. He's, he's seen the benefits uh, and the blessings of God, Je Jehovah God, on him, yet he's going to seek out a medium? That I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a, there is a medium at Endor. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to your neighbor, David. But why did all this transpire? You know, we can't be too judgmental for Saul, Saul uh, going to a medium. Can we? Because here's the thing. And although you may not go to a medium, don't you go around and, and you go to this person and, hey, man, I... I 
tell them what's going on and get their advice. And if their advice doesn't really line up with what you want to do, what do you do? You go to another person until you can find the person that you lines up with you and you go, yeah, man, I knew that you're a man of God or right there. Hey, you're a woman of God. And we go around from person to person to person when we, what we should be doing is we should be seeking God. We should be seeking God. Jesus has done it all for us. He's given us complete access to the throne room. But we don't utilize it. We would rather have a man's opinion as opposed to God's opinion. I can't tell you how many people sit in my office on a daily basis and they come to me and they tell me about stuff and I'll go, so, and everybody knows what I'm fixing to say. So what did the Lord tell you? Well, I haven't got there yet. Well, why don't you start there? It's not, you know, God loves you and Rick has a beautiful plan for your life. God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. Find out what it is and do that. I can't tell you how many people tell me, just tell me what to do. No, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Find out from the Lord. But you know what I found out? People are lazy. They are. They're lazy. They don't want to they don't want to take the time to find out from the Lord because number 1, they don't want to know what the Lord says cuz they're scared of what he might say. Mm -mm. I don't want to do that. If I ask the question and he gives me the answer, then there's an expectation I got to do it. If I don't ask the question, it's just like a dog. You ever get a dog in trouble? They won't look at you? <laughs> as long as they can't look you in the eye, they don't see me, you know? The whole the kitchen floor is strewn with all kinds of stuff. And you're like, Sophie. And she's like, looking the other way, you know? And well, that's kind of what we do. We won't seek the Lord because we're scared of the answer we're going to get. Really? I thought the, the baseline of our theology was, God is good, Satan is bad. Well, if that's the foundation of our theology, then why aren't we seeking God's goodness for our lives? Well, I think it's like Saul. We, didn't, we don't trust God. You say, wow, well, man, you're talking pretty tough tonight. But here's the, hear me, we don't. We breach faith with the Lord all the time. We don't trust in his goodness. I want to do this now, Lord. And he's saying, no, wait. But, but, okay. Not okay, but just, he just goes like this and you just got to go on by him. See, here's the thing that we have to understand about how we can relate to Saul. Because hopefully many of you can. We have to understand that, that we come from, from royalty. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're a co-heir with Jesus. You're a co-heir with him. You, you, know, you know, you have an inheritance of the cattle on a thousand hills. That's your inheritance. Those streets of gold, that's your inheritance. Right? Think about this. In, in Romans 8, 7, it says that if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Well, what's the suffering? Well, there's a lot. Many people go to persecution right, right away, which there's a portion of that that's talking about this. But you, the suffering is, where did, how did Christ suffer? He suffered in the flesh. Well, how do we need to suffer? We need to suffer in the flesh, denying our flesh, picking up our cross, and following Christ. By complete and utter obedience. Well, what does that look like? Well, it doesn't look like going to a medium. It doesn't look like going to the horoscopes. Oh, come on. I know I've gone to meddling, but I know some of us Christians, we, you know, I'm just doing it for fun. Really? Saul had the spirit. And I, I mean, that phrase there, I'm going to unpack that one day even further. But that, you know, where the Spirit of the Lord rushed in on him. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is in you if you're in Christ Jesus? He sealed you, right? He sealed you. You're totally in 110%. You're possessed by the Holy Spirit. 
He possesses you. He owns you in Christ Jesus. Now, if you ain't in Christ Jesus, guess what? You ain't owned. But he, in Christ Jesus, he owned you. He's paid for you. There's a debt there. We're not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh, Paul says. But we are debtors to the Spirit to live according to the Spirit, to walk in, according to, in accordance with the Spirit. The interesting thing is, is that Saul was chosen. Guess what, friends? You are chosen. You are chosen, and in him you were chosen before the foundations of the earth. Interestingly enough, Saul had been given favor with all these men to, to, to go around him. Well, I don't know whether you know him or not, but you've been given favor. You've been given favor. You've been given favor with the friends that you see around you. You've been given favor for the center of influences that you have in your lives. God has placed you specifically and intentionally where he has so that you have favor to positively affect or drawing down the kingdom of heaven at your workplace or at your center of influence, wherever that is. If you're going to school, guess what? It's in school. If you're working every day, guess what? It's at your work. If you're shopping every day, guess what? It's when you're shopping. It's living life. It's living lives in a, a, a lives that are totally submitted over to God. That are that are, you know, as as Pastor Lee inspired us to pray during our prayer time, that we that we would be conscious that we would prophesy our day, that we would be in tune with the Holy Spirit. One of my prayers, and it's been a prayer for so long, is that I would have the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit as Peter and John at the Temple Gate Beautiful had. That at any second, the Lord could inspire me to say, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk, dude. And it happened. See, here's the thing. We have so much privilege. We have so many rights of, as men and women of children of God. And we have so um, uh, much favor but we just we don't even utilize it because we break faith on a consistent basis with God. And thank God Jesus came and cleansed us from all of our unrighteousness. And he's, he's given us an opportunity to live a life of victory. And that life of victory just isn't for you. It's for the common good of society. It's reconciling humanity to the Father. It's reconciling humanity to the Father. So tonight, my challenge tonight is really I'm going to allow the word to challenge you in Hebrews chapter 3. I want to pick it up in verse 12. It says, take care, brothers, sisters. I want to make sure we got all inclusive here. Least there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the de deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Here's the thing. If you've made a breach of faith with Christ, Thank God for 1 John, right, chapter 1. It tells us how we can clean that mess up. I'm not going to go into it. You can read it in your own Bible and take steps necessary. But here's the thing. God, Jesus has called us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things that we, that we want will be given to us. All. God is calling the faithful servants. He is faithful. His spirit lives in us that's faithful, and he's expecting faithfulness. He's expecting it. He's expecting you to begin to take your thoughts captive to his obedience and beginning to make decisions for him as opposed to yourself. Right? Because here's the thing. Um, Will you trust him? Will you walk with him no matter what? Or if the times get tough, 
you're gone. Right? If the people start to leave like they did for Saul, would you wait on the Lord? Or are you just going to go and leave? And stop. Well, oh, man, this, this Christian thing is getting a little radical. i got to step back and take a breath. When it's all said and done at the end of your life, when it's all said and done at the end of the life, will people know you as the all-star, superstar baseball player of the county beer league? Or will they know you as a man or woman that is chasing after the very heart of God? Will they know you as the chief cook and bottle washer of whatever you do? Or will they know you as a person that was flat out in love with Jesus? That he was a weird dude or she was a weird dude, but she was weird for Jesus, right? You know, here's the thing. What can be said of you at that last day? I think about that all the time, and I think, man, I started this gig so behind the eight ball, right? I started my walk with Christ late in life. Didn't grow up in church, but by golly, I want to finish well. I want to finish well. You know, I want to do whatever Jesus is telling me to do, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Find out what he's leading you to do. Find out. Find it out. You know, here's the thing. Would you journal a whole year every night consistently for a whole year if you knew at the end of the year you were going to get a purpose for your life? Would it be worth it? A purpose to go forward and, and be a part of something so much bigger than yourself. Would it be worth it? I think it would be. I think it would be. I just think about just the, the, the minimal amount of time that I've spent in my own journal and how God has directed me and how worth it is when I've got the direction and when I've, when I've taken it. You know, I don't want to stand up and tell you here that I'm 110% obedient because that would be lying to you. But here's what I do want to encourage you to. We can try to be 100% obedient. Here's the thing, and it's a principle, it's a, it's a life principle. Strive for excellence in what you end up with. God's grace will cover. Strive, with, strive for excellence to be 100% obedient to God. And when we do that, where we fall short, God's grace will cover us. And so it's kind of a, a woe message tonight, but here's the thing. Where have you breached faith with God? If you have, man, it's a great opportunity to clean this up. It's a great opportunity tonight, as we prayed earlier, we can pray again to be empowered to go out and draw the kingdom of heaven down to our center of influence, and that's the people around us. That's the people around us, because the gifting that God has given us is for the common good of the people around us, right? So that they will know us by our love. Right? What's that look like? It's loving people. Loving people, praying for them, talking to them. You know how many people don't actually have a good conversation during the day with somebody? People are loners. Just, you know, they have a Facebook account and they have like 5,642,328 friends, but they have actually no one they can actually talk to. They have no one that's going to say, hey, man, you know, I heard, you know, the Lord told me you got something going on. And so I just want to pray for you. You think that people are just weeping out of this, out of just the fact of weeping? What I know is most people don't like crying. But when the Spirit of the Lord hits them, they have none, they have no choice, right? <laughs> they have no choice. I know I had a big old stone around my heart. I wouldn't allow myself to cry for a long time. Until a good friend of mine said, Your head if your eyes don't leak, your head will explode. So I kind of just took them up on the idea and, and it allowed the Holy Spirit to work. It came up pretty good. Right? So here's how we're going to finish tonight. I'm going to pray. And for those of you that are going to go next door and eat and support the, the, um, the team, uh, missionary team, 
Um, but if you need prayer tonight, if you need prayer for just cleaning up a mess, maybe a breach, in, breach of faith that you've, that you've had or that, you, that you've had in your past, clean that mess up. Um, I think probably there's going to be a ministry team up here. We'll get Nikki and, and Brandon up here. Darlene, Jason, right? Don't leave this place without prayer. This is what this is all about, community, praying for one another in our lives. And watch what God does. So let me pray, and then we'll get to praying. Lord, we just pray tonight, Father God, thanking you, Lord, for how graceful you are to us, Lord, and how much mercy you've extended to us, Lord. We, um, we break faith all the time with you, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that you would forgive us for those things, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would empower us to, to walk this walk that you've called us to, Lord, to, to denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and, and seeking and following after you, Lord, in, in, a, in a center of influence that our, our world around us, Lord, that you would empower us to be your uh, agents, Father God, to bring peace and love and joy and light into the world. And so, Lord, have your way with our lives. Empower us to be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen.